Good evening, everybody. Okay, and can you hear me? Okay, good. That was down the street. It comes down to the summer chair. We don't have the words right now, so we can't sing it for you. Sorry about that. We're really glad to see you here tonight. You're in for a, a good concert. And you're probably wondering, where are the guests? Well, guess what? They're in the band. There's so many things that we do, but I want to introduce to you Captains Nicholas and Peter Sam. And could you please stand up and recognize? We've had a great time so far, really, and it's going to be even, you know, even more. We have Friday night and Saturday, and not only yes, but today actually Saturday and tomorrow Sunday, so. It's been a good weekend, and uh, I really appreciate their ministry uh, as well as just the music. It's just, it's just been awesome. So, without any further ado, I'm, I'm going to ask a prayer warrior for the band, Major John Wagner, to come up with a prayer for God's blessing for this program. John. I'm just going to invite you to stand as I pray. Bow your heads, quiet your hearts and your minds as you prepare to receive the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in our place of worship tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we come into this wonderful place of worship tonight where we're going to hear music. We're going to have music that's going to inspire us, music that's going to challenge us, music that's going to touch our hearts. Music that's going to bring joy into our minds and a little tap of the foot, a clap of the hand. But above it all, Lord, we want to bring honor and glory to you. And so we bring our offering to you at this time. We offer you the gift of music. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will take it and translate it into the hearts of minds of people as a message that reflects the love of Jesus. Now, Lord, we thank you for our guests tonight. We thank you that they will come and they will minister to us as well. So we just ask God your blessing upon them. Spread your love through them to us. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person gathered here before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies.
the joy and the privilege it is for Nick and I to be here this weekend, and we've had a lovely time ourselves. Um, our hosts have been exemplary, and I wouldn't expect anything less from them because I love them dearly. <laughs> um, and it's just been a wonderful time of praising God, not just rehearsing, but actually praising God with this wonderful group of people here. And we've been sharing in scripture about wonderful experiences that people had with God. But unfortunately, as we know from scripture and we see in our world today, not everybody gets that experience from God. A lot of people don't understand it or turn away from it or just say, I'll believe it when I see it. And unfortunately, they don't grasp God and they try to put God in a box or they try to keep him in the grave. But thankfully, we know that in scripture, they could not. And today, they do not either.
day you get a chance to play a solo with the composer and arrange the music behind you. That's the case tonight. And uh, I'm honored to do this uh, with Nick conducting and uh, sweet, sweet sound.
It really is good to be with you this evening. And uh, the next piece of music you're going to hear, you can see the title is More Than a Song. It refers to the song that was written by Matt Redman many years ago. Let's say, there's a line from the middle of that song that says, Lord, I will give you more than a song because a song is more than you require. Is, is what you, more than a song is what you require. And so the arrangement of that particular song is based around that short line that you'll hear repeating throughout. So this is the band <coughs>
There stands the blind beggar, where my father used to stand and bang his umbrella and wave his bottle. Now they tell me I was born in that direction. Hackney, East London, on December 25th, 1865. The second youngest of the eight children of William and Catherine Booth. I was first named Eveline after some heroin in Uncle Tom's cabin. I later adopted the name Evangeline because I feel it better suits what my calling in life has been. It also sounds a bit more distinguished, don't you think? Oh, how I wanted to preach, but Papa had me selling war cries. It wasn't enough for me, not for me indeed. I want to preach, Papa. I'm 17 now. Send me out to preach tomorrow. Can I? Papa, we should go into the worst districts and live there. Dress like the people, only be clean. Visit and sympathize. And set before them the example of a good life. We are ever calling them down, up, without providing the ladder, and going down to show them the way. Well, the next thing I knew, I had rented a room in Drury Lane, along with a couple of other ladies. We became known as the Cellar, Gutter, and Garrett Brigade. We worked all day in the slum areas, where whole families were crowded into single rooms in great lodging houses. I swept, cleaned floors, and listened to heartbreaking stories of despairing mothers. The music, oh yes, the music of the Salvation Army is a romance. We've used music any and every type of music to entice those men out of the public houses and into our meetings. We even used secular tunes. My mother Catherine used to say, I contend that the devil has no right to a single note of music. One popular ditty of the day went something like this. Champagne Charlie is my name. Champagne drinking is me. Oh, 
salvation on the orphanage. God will give us what we give back to him. And the rewards are great. For through it all, God's love never dies. It will sing. It will ring out. It will never die. This is the world's greatest romance. God's love.
back to uh, Captain Heather, beautiful soul, Jesus Peter.
come one day. The first tree said, I want to be made into a box. But not just any box. I want to be the treasure chest of a wealthy man. I will have ornate carvings on my side, and my hinges and hasps will be made of silver. And I will hold within myself gold, rubies, diamonds, and pearls, the most precious treasure in the world. The second tree said, someday, I wish to be part of a boat. But not just any boat. I want to be the mast of a great sailing ship in the Royal Navy. I will stand planted on the deck, and the mainsail will pull against me. Together we will draw the ship through the waves so smoothly that the king himself will be able to sleep on board, even in the darkest storm. The third tree said,
in the story of Samuel. It was in the quietness of the night that God called out to him and he eventually, after a bit of consultation, responded, I'm listening, Lord. Now each of us tonight has come here with different experiences of today and different experiences of the past week and the past few months as we've seen things going with our families and things changing in the world around about us. And perhaps we've even come here tonight with different expectations of what we're going to hear, different expectations of what will meet us, who will meet us, and what will confront us this evening, what we will hear. Some of you might have come here simply to support family and friends. Some of you might be here because you came to hear the music. It might be that some of you came here tonight because you heard a rumour that there was a composer here that's not yet dead. <laughs> But I hope that at some point during this evening, you might have heard the voice of God speak to you. Maybe you've heard a prompting from God. Maybe if you haven't yet heard a prompting from God, then that moment is still yet to come sometime this evening. Or maybe it's because we're not very good at listening. <coughs> Or maybe it's because something has happened in life where we've tried to block out the voice of God because I'm okay, thanks. Or perhaps it's easier to ignore him or pretend that he's not real. <coughs> but I'll just share with you just very briefly a story about someone who heard the voice of Jesus and they responded to that voice. And it's found in John's Gospel, chapter 5. <coughs> this weekend we began with the band looking at uh, four occasions where somebody's life was changed by meeting Jesus. We've done two of them so far. This is the third one. <coughs> and tomorrow we'll look at another one. Here's this story in John, chapter 5. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, and though that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath, and so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, the Lord forbids you to carry your mat. Of course. <coughs> but he replied, The man who made you well said to me, Pick up your mat. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. You see, there's something about the presence of Jesus. The human presence of Jesus in that place that must have had an authority. For him to say to somebody, get up and walk. Because why else would somebody who's been there that long get up and walk? You know, gospel writers in other places of 
commented at different times about Jesus having an authority about him in his teaching. An authority like no other is commented on. And on this occasion, Jesus is dealing with people who didn't actually know him. Yet, they heard and did it. This man had absolutely no idea who Jesus was, as far as we know. Yet, at the command to get him a walk, he got up and walked. I hope we can learn from that that when Jesus speaks to us, there's a sense of conviction that comes to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. As we hear from Jesus, and it's a sense of conviction that requires us to respond in some way to him. And so I want to ask you this question. If he has spoken to you tonight, then how are you responding? If Jesus has spoken to you tonight, how are you responding? You know, there's a moment in this story just before that call and response moment that I find absolutely fascinating. And it's a moment that's very true to life, not just then, but right now today for many of us. You see, it's, it happens here. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, want to get well. So, the eminent replied, I have no one to help me to get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down before me. Thirty-eight years of waiting. Thirty-eight years of not responding. Thirty-eight years of putting it off and blaming somebody else. How familiar is that? Was there not one single opportunity in those 38 years when he could have actually been at the front of the line and beaten everybody else to it because he was there ready? You know, it was just a couple of weeks ago I had a wonderful story, a wonderful testimony of somebody who, even though his wife was very active in court life for so many years, he had avoided being part of the court for 60 years, all because he was offended by somebody or something, and it was somebody else's fault, apparently. 60 years. And then just two weeks ago, somebody spoke to the boy and said, come inside, come inside. And it was after the morning meeting because he was waiting to pick Phyllis up. And the boy went inside and he was gloriously saved. Hallelujah. You see, as human beings, we are very gifted procrastinators. We like to put things off. We like to hold off until we feel more ready. We like to wait until, oh, there's always tomorrow. Oh, I'll get round to that. We know that well, don't we? It's especially true when we're looking to avoid things that might involve change or something that might involve us going slightly outside of our comfort zone. And maybe you here tonight, I don't know who you are, but you might be somebody who has been trying to keep your distance from Jesus for some particular reason that nobody else knows about. But you. It might be something that's happened in the past. And you know it's usually because of another human being rather than something Jesus did. But we try to keep Jesus at a distance. 
Or maybe you're here tonight and you're in a place in life where you're so busy for Jesus that you actually forget to be with Jesus at various times of the day. Because we're very good at keeping ourselves busy, aren't we? So busy for Jesus that we forget to go and see him and spend some time with him and take some time and pray that day. And maybe you and I are listing all these excuses like, yes, but you don't understand about. Or, but you don't know what happened. Or, you don't know what I went through when. 38 years. For that man. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the, the world that he gave For you and for me. Not, as the next verse says, we're reminded, not to condemn the world, not to condemn you and me, but to save us, to save the world through Him, so that we might live. So, as I reminded you of that truth, I ask you again, how are you responding if God has spoken to you this evening? If God has spoken to you today, then I urge you to respond to him. Because he's not speaking to you for no reason whatsoever. He's speaking to you and me because we are <coughs> loved. Perhaps if he has spoken to you, he has reminded you that you need to know his salvation. Perhaps he's reminded you that you need to spend more time with him to become more like him by the help of his Holy Spirit. Perhaps he said that he wants you to have a particular conversation with somebody else about this same thing sometime next week. Whatever God has said to you this evening, whether we are listening or not. Don't leave this place without hearing these words. You are loved by God. You are his beloved child. And he <coughs> wants you to know the joy of his salvation. That's it. He loves us and he wants us to know the joy of his salvation. If you hear nothing else tonight, hear that. Hear that and respond to him. <coughs> and take it home with you and take something else. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you love us and that you invite us into a relationship with you and to grow to love you too. And by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us, we're able to journey with you to become more like you. But Lord, perhaps if we're facing struggles and issues, then Lord, help us guide us, comfort us, and let us know the presence of you in our lives. Let us know the, your love within us so that we can experience it and share it with others around about us. Lord, as we've heard your voice this evening, and you've called us to hear you, we respond. And we 
we say, I love you, Lord. We've lifted our voices and we ask that our lives, our very beings, are brought as an offering to you as a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Knowing that you've asked us for more than just our music and our songs, but for our entire lives dedicated to you. So Lord, accept our offerings, we pray, the offerings of our lives. And we pray for our friends and our family around the world. For many who are facing the rest of this time, may they know your presence, and your healing, and your hope in their situations. Continue to bless us and love us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Band's going to play to you now a march entitled The Goldonian, as you can see from the program. Now, the story behind this, just to give you a bit of story, is that it was a request to be written for the 130th anniversary of the Cambridge City of Gaul, which was Heather and I's previous appointment that we moved away from this last summer after five wonderful years. And um, in recent years, there's been a move away from being able to publish marches with core <coughs> names in Salvation Army publications. And so when this was sent to the publication, it was originally Cambridge 130, so they said, can you do something with it? So I got creative and didn't tell them <laughs> that Cambridge used to be called God. And so the Galtonian is someone who lives in God, where Cambridge City is. And so nobody who published this has his any idea that this is written for the people of God. <laughs> so here's the gold token.
again, I foster down. I really appreciate your attendance here this evening. And it really is a pleasure for me to say a real thank you to both Nick and Heather for a beautiful evening they shared with us, <coughs> the, the talents and, uh, and your ministry in both the word and uh, Heather. Thank you so much.